stories will thrive. Welcome to another video by the Blue Tongues of Hell for some more Hildar Chronicles. This chapter is called Heart of Soil. Emerald and violet yarns of diaphanous gossamer were nearly visible in the limpid sky. King Agni climbed up onto his powerful war horse, Slepnir, and inhaled the evening tang of coastal winds, fresh dung, and the moist peat from the afternoon drizzle. Neither Hilda nor his wife had showed up to wave him goodbye, and he gazed sorrowfully upon the bulky old walls of Gronelgar Castle. The facade was riddled with cracks and smothered in ivy. While Ogni rode through Vanaheim, he remembered Skeggold praising the benefits of letting Ivy run wild. She said it solidified their home, brought it closer to where all life begins. She would often tease him by pointing out the obvious, that the green hue gave the castle's name real meaning. Silk ghosts glided out of Slepnir's nostrils like soft antlers. The king made his ride, burst into gallop to impress the crowds, and when his troops ahead thought they were going to be trampled, he brought his horse to a frantic halt in a spray of dirt. He didn't care about appearances. He needed them to be on their toes, ready for anything. He woke them up again with a snap of the reins and span his horse round on its hind legs. One of Slepnir's hooves caught an antlered helmet and Agni gave the aurochs of a man glaring up at him a piercing stare. That's it, lad. I want more of that. We're at war, you wretches. Do you think those stinking swines from Moon Castle will go easy on you tonight? No. He paused with a growing smile. Because they don't know we're coming. And they'll never know what hit them. Despite being exhausted by the ongoing war against Helheim and Muspelheim, the soldiers were eager to dig their weapons into their enemy's flesh, and they roared with bloodthirsty approval. The king leaned forwards to ask Gunnar if the berserkers were on their way. According to plan, sire, they should be close to Helheim by now, ready to butcher any locals and bait the Helheim warriors into pursuing them to Vigrid Plains. Agni nodded and waved him away to go protect his daughter and the queen during his absence. When one fiery arrow scrapes the heavens, we storm onto the battlefield and strike them so hard that not even their skeletons will be left to testify your rage and bravery. Tonight, Helheim will suffer. Like a defenseless virgin, said a woman, fastening a snakehead iron helmet over her eyes. Like a treacherous whore, replied Ogni with a devilish smile, 
ordering drums of Helogi to be shared around. Drink with me, men and women of Odin, and let us drink our enemies' blood together! Hilda heard nothing of the raucous cheering in the center of Anaheim. All she knew was that she was late. Freyr galloped around Nebelwood with rare passion, as if trying to catch a falling star. The evenings were not getting any warmer and Hilda's watery eyes let crystal drops fall behind her through wind-beaten hair. The visions of Voluspa vanished from Hilda's mind as she approached a familiar small grove near Vigrid Plains where she would usually meet her forbidden lover, Hedil. The latter stood leaning against one of the many mossy boulders bulging out of the ground and offered to help the princess down from her saddle, despite knowing she would not accept. I got your message. Couldn't wait, said Hilda, diving violently into Hedil's arms. The Prince of Helheim lovingly sniffed Hilda's woody scalp and kissed her head. We could lose our heads for this. Though anything would be better than attending another royal betrothal. Hilda gave his chest a thump. <laughs> a meager distraction am I, Moon Prince? Who's the lucky duck? Although Hilda pretended to be mildly interested, a royal wedding was groundbreaking news in this ongoing conflict. Hedil gripped Hilda by the scruff of the neck. Spare me a conversation about my cousin Astrid. I'm risking everything to see you here. I know, my sweet prince, I know, said Hilda, sensing a bulge in Hedil's trousers. She also felt a slight remorse as she undressed, thinking of her father's army on its way to defeat Helheim. It brought little pleasure to light the man she loved, but there was little she could do to stop the war or her secret plans in motion. Passing through the oak branches, covered in pale yellow lichen, moon rays caught the curves of Hilda's body and illuminated her stern yet enamoured face. She rolled a small vial of dark liquid in her palm hesitating to take a quick swig to put an end to the madness after one final embrace with this man she could never marry. A few sour drops and her troubles would be over. When the starry sky was full of jade lace serpents and purple smoke dragons, and the full moon had glided into full sight over the glade where Hedil and Hilda were vigorously enlaced. A flicker of fire soared through the air. Neither of the two lovers noticed the arrow, and they gladly forgot about the battles to come. Hilda let the vial roll onto the moss and took her mind off their impossible relationship. The everlasting taste of doom she felt 
when it was time to leave this safe haven and return to her miserable life. Hilda couldn't remember what she was really angry about and drowned in Hedil's kisses. still wonder what she would tell Hedil after King Ogni had crushed her lover's realm and slain his parents. <coughs> to the unnerving sound of croaking jackdaws, Hedil pressed his perspiring chest against Hilda's milk shoulder blade that glistened as she would move away. And yet something was bothering the heir to Helheim's throne. The eerie bird cries were perhaps annoying, but not enough to make Hedil's head spin or bones tingle and ache. He stared lugubriously at Hilda's arched bare neck, ignoring her smooth hands guiding him to warm her small breasts, and he fought off a sudden urge to bite a chunk out of his lover's spine. Shaking his head furiously, Hedil dug his nails into the back of his own thighs, drawing blood instead of tasting her tantalizing flesh. In a flash of mixed rage and euphoria, Hedil removed himself from between Hilda's thighs and lay on his back on a carpet of light blue moss. Hilda rolled over too and sighed faintly, letting out a sensual cloud of ghostly breath. She got dressed and lay a head on Hedil's warm chest, reflecting the moonlight. His heart was beating like a war drum. Do you ever wonder what lies beneath those mountains? My starling, asked Hilda, gazing through the dark trees. She ran her fingers through his pale hair, removing his rebel locks from his eyes, and drank a few gulps from her leather pouch. The thrones, my pale raven. He replied with eyes shut. When they come to life as the sun sets and turn to gold, I sometimes imagine which divine creatures come out from the Nibelungen underworld. After what we've been through lately, I sometimes wonder if those who take seat there are actually demons rather than than gods Hilda said finishing his sentence looking up to see why he had stopped speaking Starling are you alright Starling Hedil looked mesmerized. He gobbed at the night sky, paralyzed. His sweaty face bleached by the moonlight. He drooled from the mouth. His pupils dilated, then shrunk to narrow ovals. In the blink of an eye, his bones cracked and his skin shriveled to dark grey. 
Hilda found no voice to scream as Hetil's features grew closer to those of a rapid beast than a desirable prince. Hetil snapped onto his feet and grabbed Hilda's neck single-handedly with harsh violence. He held her above the mossy ground and tightened his grip around her swan neck as Hilda fought back with helpless kicking and scratching. Long black claws cracked out of Hedil's fingertips and splattered blood over white mushrooms at his hairy feet. Hilda's futile attacks withered. Even touching him made her sick as she gazed in horror at what Hedil had suddenly become. When Hilda couldn't bear looking at him anymore and turned away, the beast roared to the moon and sliced through Hilda's abdomen. He tore out strings of glaze and gizzards and painted the peaceful glade in buckets of blood. The sore as she slumped to the ground was a dying fetus hanging from Edil's claws. Our child, the red seedling swayed above his mother, catching moonbeams on its bloody wet skin. Tiny antlers. Edil sat back down with Hilda in his arms. The creature licked the fetus like a grouse drumstick and peacefully nibbled the soft flesh until the moon hid behind somber clouds. The din of charging belligerent warriors invaded the soiled grove. On horseback, Agni's troops jumped over rocks and boulders, crashed through branches, and trampled the two tragic lovers as they galloped away to fight Helheim's army. Edil's cracked open ribcage exposed a few last heartbeats of an organ covered in fresh peat. Earlier that night, in the pale blue graveyard, outside the white walls of Moon Castle, a young man knelt beside a flat tombstone, draped in willow leaves. He was hardly dressed for grave digging, and appeared out of place in his fine lilac linen garments, adorned with thin leather straps around his wrists and chest. The elegant carvings intrigued him. He had been brought up to believe that only Maspelheimers were blessed with talent for ornamental workmanship, and this slab of stone was historic proof of the opposite. <gasps> his heart nearly stopped when a pale hand stroked his cheek. A thin girl in flowery braids glided by, glancing back enigmatically 
as she disappeared behind the large headstone. The young man thought he was having a panic attack. He remembered to breathe and placed the hand where his sword's hilt should have been. side as she stretched the word as long as she could to make it sound haunting. Are you here to brandish your sword that you left with my Vadir? Or help me find one, Harald of Rune and Sigrid? The heir to Muspelheim's throne chuckled behind the fist pretending to warm his fingers. Astrid of Bjorn and Estrid, I presume? And you're the sultry hunk who's supposed to steal my bubbly heart, said Astrid, still playing the graveyard ghoul as she danced towards Harald. Romantic as hell, this creepy bone dump, don't you think? Imagine the stories we'll be telling our grandchildren by the fire in our golden castle. You're as chirpy as a cricket, aren't you? Said Harald, who was still processing how different the royal maiden was from how he had expected. Astrid brushed her bridal dress clean and twirled around an old tombstone partially covered in moss. You can tell, Harald, who you were meant to be, she said teasingly. The signs are in the sky. It's a full moon. The frost isn't biting my nipples off, and not a soul about to keep us off each other. A girl's dream come true. Do I detect an undercoat of irony on your colourful tongue? Forgive me if I didn't meet your expectations, Lady Astrid. We obviously had other plans before our kings and queens decided to make us go sword hunting. What? You weren't swept off your rainbow trout boots by such a rare catch, she laughed. Come on, long nose. I know a few gold mines that haven't been ransacked yet. Harald accepted Astrid's hand and followed her through the moonlit graves. You, on the other hand, truly do seem to be a divine creature. Astrid gave him a wink and hopped over the white tomb belonging to one of her ancestors on her mother's side. Let's see what you're made of, Harald, she said, raising her bridal dress tauntingly. Harald didn't know whether to be aroused or outraged. Astrid slowly slid her fingers up her long, pale legs, only to reveal a garden trowel strapped to her thigh. We can share if you don't want to get your soft bare hands dirty. Harold stepped over the moonstone grave towards Astrid and slipped an arm between her legs to unstrap the trowel with impassive assurance. Astrid flushed red. Didn't see that coming, sneaky. Wait. Did you hear that? Enough games, Astrid. 
We'll have plenty of time for that later. King Ogni's loyal berserkers efficiently drew Helheim's warriors into Vanaheim's nets. But they had poorly estimated the enemy's reaction to the slaughtering of a few mere peasants. The two nobodies were in fact royal members of two different families. The berserkers spotted the easy targets who were busy plundering graves and they put them to death and threw their heads over Helheim's white walls moments before a celebration of great diplomatic importance. Maspelheim and Helheim were ready to bury the hatchet and unite their rounds thanks to a royal wedding. King Ogni would have described this strike of good luck as nipping the Maspelheim-Helheim alliance in the bud. Unfortunately, the vehement ire and utter disbelief of both realms only inflamed their hatred towards Vanaheim. In immediate retaliation to the foiled wedding, and of course the deaths of Astrid and Harald, the two realms unleashed their partially drunk armies on the cowardly berserkers with unprecedented fury. The following battle on the plains of Vigrid was of terrific violence. The frenzied fighting left barely anyone alive. All three kings had been slain like hounds. Horses agonized with chopped off legs in the bloody plains. Men and women rolled around in the grass while sadistic ravens pecked at flabby gashes. One fallen warrior had fingers stuck in the eye sockets of an enemy who was still trying to chew through his throat. Another one biting off the breast of a headless archer had been hacked in two. Those still alive wouldn't stop battering the corpses around them, notwithstanding the confusion of who the victims really were. Frantic wild dogs and foxes lapped up the blood pouring from scratched off ears and mouths, giving the morning dew a hint of pink. Just as the morning sun began to bleed sharp light, over the eastern horizon, an orchestrated sea of mist flooded the battlefield. Diaphanous tree-like fingers and vaporous fangs drowned the dead in a pungent gas. Almost instantaneously, Severed limbs twitched and slithered back to their lost torsos. Bludgeoned skulls mended like hatching eggs in reverse. Scorched skin regenerated on the mutilated corpses of carbonized Vikings. Shredded nerves and mangled veins warmed back to life. Scattered organs floated out of the grass into the mist and back to their previous butchered owners. All the while, 
a man of great stature, hid behind an oak tree in the grove. He watched Hilda's semi-digested child ooze out of Hedy's lips, regenerate and sink into her pale-ripped belly that glued itself back to its youthful firm state. Hedil slowly mutated back to his human form. His smashed bones and crushed facial features shifted to his previous handsome appearance as the acrid mist crept away towards Nebelwood. The tall observer had gone and Freya gingerly approached the undead couple and licked Hilda's forehead. Later that morning, all resuscitated soldiers from all three realms staggered back to their homes in a haze of oblivion. None could remember the previous day's events, and none could explain what they had been doing, or where they had gone. The mist from Nebelwood had spread out far, too far this time, blurring with poisonous gas the memories of villagers who did not even participate in the battles and stayed behind to defend their towns. Wedding plans were not resumed. The headless groom and bride did not need to be buried, but recalled nothing of their first memorable encounter. Most of the miraculously healed remained confused and tormented by the haunting night. Every cell of their undead bodies cried out in agony, and yet their minds couldn't put a finger on what to be traumatised about. When Hilda woke up with a splitting headache, a thick fog clouded her thoughts, which gave her a frustrating inkling of what must have occurred. The Huldra. Hedil was found sleeping naked in Helheim's graveyard, still dreaming of his beloved pale raven. How wonderfully smooth her moon-white skin was. How delectable their tender flesh tasted. See you soon for the next chapter of